Here's a 54-year-old man with hemochromatosis arthritis. He's five years after having an arthroplasty, unfortunately went on to gain a lot of weight, which is a bad thing for these joints, and pushed the lower half of the arthroplasty right down through the talus. And also you see the sort of cystic formation around the joint, which is from debris from the wear on the poly that's between the metal parts of the joint that gets in and causes uh, granulation tissue to form around the joint. So he had two problems. One was collapse of the joint and the other damage to the bone by the wear particles. Revision was done with a larger implant and by methamethacrylate and by removing, of course, the cystic tissue and grafting it or replacing it with methamethacrylate and getting him back to a relatively normal ankle. And he had already realized that he needed to lose weight and begun on that. He will no doubt need to be revised again, probably by the stemmed arthroplasty that I just showed you previously. A final example, a single case exhibits several features and a protocol-driven solution with long-term follow-up. On the upper right, you see um, a woman who had had a severe fracture uh, in her distal leg. Uh, she's a 50-year-old dietitian, um, moderately overweight, uh, and has now a very bad problem with arthritis and malalignment uh, and uh, not even complete union of her, her fractures. Now you can see in the lower left that we had done an osteotomy to realign the leg and put in smaller hardware which then doesn't protect the bone so much and allows the character of the bone to restore itself. In other words, you get rid of some osteopenia. On the right then you see that it's healed up in better alignment and you can see it in the other plane as well now in good alignment and prepared well to do a total ankle arthroplasty, which we did now about eight years ago. And this shows in surgery, putting in the uh, new ankle. Uh, on the lower left and the upper right, you see it uh, uh, at surgery, and it shows the uh, pin that we put in the bone to hold the ankle in the right position as we put the uh, uh, ankle in place. And then on the um, lower two films, you can see it at six month follow up, ready to begin normal activity. And then we see her at five years and then at seven years post op. She's done, she's been back at work uh, doing her regular job without much of any symptoms for now, well, by now, about eight years. After having been on crutches after her injury and without being able to use her leg for at least a year. Now, this is a, a tremendous preservation of not only quality of life, but uh, being able to make her own living and, and she's still teaching and doing all these things. She's probably got another year or so left on this one. And then with our new equipment, we can simply revise her and give her hopefully another 10 years, which will easily bring her past retirement age. This is a lot of what I would call bang for the medical care buck uh, in terms of the fact that this was not, it's a moderately expensive procedure, but if it gives you that many years of normal quality of life and being able to work, it seems well worthwhile. In summary then, ankle arthroplasty, or total ankle joint replacement, is an acceptable alternative in treatment of end-stage ankle arthritis when done with protocol-driven indications and appropriate associated procedures. It is, however, unpredictable, uh, and even in the hands of somebody who is supposed to know very much what they're doing with a lot of experience, it has still got a ways to go to be a really predictable procedure. So we've tried to answer a few questions patients ask, and one is just asking patients who've come here over the last 10 years what it is they can't do. We need to know what they can't do so we know how to gear our treatments in the future. And this is a very busy slide using the musculoskeletal functional assessment tool, which is designed to limit, to measure the limitations patients sense in their function. And you see the highlighted areas that mobility the higher the number, the worse the function. And you see that mobility for these patients is worse than controls, it's worse than patients who've had um, tibia fractures, and it's worse than patients with hip and knee arthritis. Fine motor's not as bad, but doing housework and working, these are really critical issues for these patients. The ankle actually returns about 50% more energy per step than the hip and knee does during running and, and fast walking. So when we asked all these patients 
what was wrong, the mobility question kept coming up and up and up. And it's mobility and recreational activities that restrict, uh, restrict these patients over and over again. So we want to gear our treatment strategies toward getting them walking and getting them comfortable. And of course, outcome always depends on patient selection. And in this case, the position of the fusion, the state of the surrounding joints, as Dr. Hansen said, if you have a worn out subtalar joint, there's no point in trying to do an ankle fusion because that next joint's just going to hurt. And when we think about functional outcome, we always have to think about what the alternatives are. As Dr. Hansen mentioned, if the alternative is a baloney amputation, then there are th risks that you can take to try to get function back because you know that your sequel, your alternative operation, isn't all that functional either. So there are some data to show us how ankle fusions do. In one study following patients from tw 2 to 22 years, about half of them, a little more than half of them, had no limitations. 66% in their own minds had had a good outcome. Now, 66% is not bad, but it sure isn't great. If, if you told a patient there's a one-third chance their operation's not going to be doing very well in five years, a lot of people would turn around and head to the door. So it sounds like we need something better. There's another longer-term study published in clinical orthopedics a couple years ago where they followed 48 patients for nine years. 92% of them felt that they had a good or pretty good outcome, but when questioned, 47% of them actually had arthritic pain in the surrounding joints and limited the activity that they did because of the ankle. Saltzman's group had the, a very nice long-term study, and I'll summarize all this busy wording just by saying that the vast majority of patients after 9 to 15 years begin to have arthritis in the surrounding joints. So function matters and, and position matters. A stand, this is a very straightforward ankle arthrodesis. You can see the osteophytes all around the ankle joint and the bone-on-bone -bone function with no cartilage at all left in the joint space. And these patients can do well because, as you can see, the position is relatively straightforward. An osteotomy is made in the fibula, and you align that talus with the long axis of the tibia. And this line marked by the arrow should be about 105 to 108 degrees. And as you can see, what Dr. Henson pointed out before is this, this patient's a decent candidate for an arthrodesis because of this well-maintained joint space in the next joints along the trail. That's what it looks like at six months. They are splinted for two weeks, and an ace wrap and a boot goes on at the end of that two-week period. Return to weight bearing varies between six and 12 weeks, depending on, the, depending on the diagnosis and the patient. The optimal position is a little bit of external rotation, a little bit of plantar flexion, and a little bit of algus. It's not very common that we achieve that goal, though. In a lot of the studies, we find that less than half the patients are ideally positioned after an ankle fusion. In this nicely done study looking at function after ankle fusion, these individuals found that when the patients were fused in a good position, they walked well, but when the patients were, were fused in a position of plantar flexion, they had a very altered gait that affected not only their foot, but their knee and their hip and their spine as well. So nine patients that were fused in a neutral position, in an ideal position, when they walked barefoot, heel rise occurred early, there was less knee flexion and more posterior ground reaction force, but when they walked in shoes, nobody could really tell. Now if they, if, they are, if they come to you in a bad position or badly fused, it's possible to salvage these by cutting some fibula. You can see this patient is missing the fibula had been taken off at the time of the prior uh, two ankle fusions that did not succeed. And you can actually cut this fibula and bring it down and use it to stabilize the foot in a good position. And this patient went on to uneventful healing. This removed fibula idea is fairly popular, as you can see, and it's not an uncommon circumstance to have to go up there and grab some of that fibula and bring it down. But they do heal, and they do have function similar to a primary ankle fusion. So we talked about position and its impact on function. This is a, a slide given to me um, by Andy Sands, who he got from uh, a colleague in Europe. And this is a patient who had long, long-term follow-up, five years post-op. You can see how much compensatory show parts motion there is in the plantar flexion and, and dorsiflexion views. This is a patient of mine who had bilateral ankle arthritis. He was only 48. He had had both of his hips and both of his knees replaced already. Just click on it. And when I was talking to him about ankle replacement, he said, why would I want to have anything but an ankle arthrodesis? And this is what his foot was doing. 
Now it looks like a lot of motion, but if you look at the hind foot, there's very little motion in the hind foot. It's all through Schilpart's joint and the subtalar joint. This is another patient who was seven years out from an ankle arthrodesis. And I'm not going to tell you which side is fused and which side isn't fused. Try and guess for me. As you can see, she can walk very normally on a flat surface with shoes. It's only when she's walking barefoot or on an inclined surface that you can assess the changes in gait. So we try to compare this to total ankle arthroplasty. It's very difficult to do because the data are all over the place. But a meta-analysis done of 18 studies of ankle arthroplasty showed that the superficial infection rate is about 10%. The deep infection rate is about 1.6%. Loosening occurs about 5% of the time. There are interoperative problems with dislocation and fracture, and about 12.5% of them need to be revised. So again, this is not terrible. It's not great. It would be nice if we could do better, but we really don't have a good idea of what better is. So the summary for ankle fusion is it works well if it's done right. Gait is normal when wearing a shoe and walking on a flat surface. The quality of life declines in the long term due to increasing arthritis in the other joints, but we don't re know what the better alternatives are. So for a few patients, they'll fall into a zone where neither ankle arthroplasty or ankle arthrodesis is good. And for those, there are some what we would have to call experimental operations, like taking cadaver bone and putting it into the ankle joint. There are a few studies with small numbers of patients finding about a 60% success rate. Again, not at all a very good success rate, but maybe better than the alternative. This is a patient of mine from 1992 who was only 29 years old, and as Dr. Hansen mentioned, body weight to bone size ratio. This woman was about 5'4", and uh, probably well over 250 pounds. Not an ideal candidate for a replacement, not an ideal candidate for an arthrodesis. So we used some cadaver bone, replaced part of her talus and part of her plafond. And this is what she looked like during surgery. This is what she looked like at the end. And here she is a year later. It's not a normal joint, but at least the foot is straightened out. It belongs under the tibia where it belongs. And she, she lasted only about seven years on this before I had to take her to the next step and do an arthrodesis. The last piece of the armamentarium, Dr. Hansen covered a little bit already. If the bone's not lined up, you can line it up. And just lining them up sometimes will take away the ankle pain. So this is a patient who was quite deformed 25 years after a tibia fracture. I had planned to straighten her out and then re do a replacement. This is what she looked like immediately after surgery. This is what she looked like six months after surgery. And she decided not to continue with further treatment because just straightening out her ankle had relieved her symptoms to such an extent that she didn't think she needed anything more. So when the patient asks what's best for, for her or him, it's a tough question to answer. We've done a couple things to try to help us get data to answer this question for the patients and for the doctors. So we strapped some activity monitors on a group of patients who had had a successful ankle arthroplasty and a successful ankle arthrodesis. We let them do whatever they wanted, and we had them keep a daily journal and a log and assess their functional outcome. And we actually counted the number of steps they took, the number of steps they took per hour, per day, per minute over that 14-day period. And we thought we'd get some wonderful information to share with the patients. And we, did a f we learned a few things, that all the patients were very active, whether they had an ankle arthrodesis or an ankle replacement. About half of them reported activity limitations, and it was primarily in sporting activities, not in the things they do from day to day and the things that they do in the workplace. But we found no difference in this activity.